Very interesting. Um, if I could isolate uh, just the El Paso area and discuss some of these economic issues and also those related with government alloca allocations and equity. Um, I, I ran into some interesting information in one of your binders that said that in the 1950s, the per capita income in El Paso was actually greater than the rest of Texas. But it seems that that has declined over several decades. And, uh, you know, with El Paso being located in such a remote corner of Texas, I always tell my students, you don't live in the real Texas from a politically uh, cultural standpoint. Um, I wonder, um, is there fairness and equity in the system? Uh, and, and is that related to participation in state government? The, is El Paso getting its uh, equitable allocation of government funding as compared to other areas of the state? The short answer to that is no. And there's a much bigger story to get into there. Let's go back to the 1950s. So World War II is over. Six million uniformed men and women are coming back. They need jobs. Uh, Eisenhower sets out the national highway system, puts people to work. You have this transformative period in the American economy. El Paso is really at the top of the game. El Paso's history from the 1880s to 1950 has been railroad, Mexican Revolution, the enormous expansion of Fort Bliss, and all of a sudden you've got one of the wealthier communities in the Southwest. When you look at our peer communities, Albuquerque, Phoenix, Phoenix, back in uh, 1913, Phoenix, when Arizona became a state, really didn't hardly exist. Do you know where Arizona did its statehood celebration? No, I don't. So you, you just become a state. It's 1911, 1912, whatever. You're really proud to have been, you went from a territory to a state. You're going to have a giant party. Where would you have your party if you're Arizona? Well, you'd think Phoenix, it's their biggest city, right? It wasn't even hardly a, a blip on the Gila River. Arizona did its statehood celebration at the Camino Real Hotel in El Paso, Texas. <laughs> Why? Because this was the booming place. 1913, 1920, going forward. During the Mexican Revolution, horrific, bloody revolution for El Paso, 100,000 of the most entrepreneurial people in Mexico moved here. Really, truthfully, we were the biggest gainer in the Mexican Revolution because a whole set of shop owners and business owners and bank owners and people who ran businesses and owned ranches fearful for their own safety in Mexico moved here. You go look at the history of Sunset Heights, look at the history of Central El Paso, that's what happened. My point is we were here at the top of a game. We were at 104% of the nation's average per capita income. And then fast forward to 1996, and we're at 56% of average per capita income for the country. How in the world did we decline a point a year for 50, 60 years? That's a good question to ask, right? Mm -hmm. We got involved, many of us, in something called the Court of Inquiry back in the 90s to ask that question and ask, why is this community not getting a commensurate share of the benefits of those programs that are so essential to our future from state government, UTEP, community college, public education system, infrastructure. I was on the team that handled uh, the highway system. In one year, the highway system here got $26 million, where a city smaller than us, Austin, got $180 million. You've got to ask some hard questions. How in the world did that happen? And the answer was, it happened because you in El Paso did not lay out a profile of being a great American city. You were content in being a poor big city and your leaders didn't lay out a vision of capturing your talent and your opportunity and your potential. And you in Austin were only too pleased to take that money elsewhere, which is exactly what happened. And so on both sides of this issue, you gotta look in the mirror. You gotta ask yourself, when you look at a place like San Antonio in the 60s and very similar profile to El Paso, they've got one thing that we didn't have, which is the Alamo. More tourism goes there than any other place. But they take a dusty old dirty ditch and they turn it into a river walk. That's some great work. And so they built slowly a tourism sector that was related to one competitive advantage. We had the Alamo. That leads to 
convention centers, leads to getting the San Antonio Spurs, leads to a rather major profile in tourism, right? The question back here is, when you had in the 1960s the opportunity to get a medical school, why didn't you do it? You should have been the next major medical school in the country in the 60s. El Paso, ask yourself the question, why didn't you go and get a medical school in the 60s? It should have happened. Instead of a community one-third our size, you went and got a medical school. It happened to be called Lubbock. So there's two questions to ask. What did you do or fail to do to lay out a vision big enough for your talent, your potential, and your opportunity? And what was Austin doing harvesting that money and redistributing it to other places that did have that vision and were only too pleased to eat your lunch, which is exactly what happened.